In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Of all the words uttered by Our Lady at Fatima over a century ago, I should think that these are the ones which are most well known to all of us. And there can be no doubt that it is these words which inspired the promulgation of the feast which we keep today. It did not go without saying After all, in this octave of the Assumption, which we have been keeping, we have, for instance, the great St. John Eudes, who centuries before had already promulgated devotion to the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary. And indeed, that term is retained in the celebration of his feast, the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary. Pius XI allowed the celebration although not universally, of a feast of the most pure heart of Mary. But Pius XII, in the midst of the Second World War, in 1942, would be the first to promulgate a feast in honor of the heart of Mary to be observed throughout the world, employing the precise phrase chosen by the Mother of God when she appeared at Fatima, the Immaculate Heart. Thus, there is no doubt that the Sovereign Pontiff was doing so in acknowledgement of the truth of the message of Fatima. It had already been 13 years since Our Lady had appeared to Sister Lucy on June 13, 1929, and declared, The moment has come when God asks the Holy Father, in union with the bishops of the world, to make the consecration of Russia to my heart, promising to save it by these means. After the First World War, men did not heed the call of Our Lady of Fatima to return to God, despite the earnest pleas of Popes Benedict XV and Pius XI. Disillusioned by murderous war, men gave themselves more eagerly than ever before to the pursuit of money and sensual pleasures. The consecration of Russia requested by Our Lady in 1929 did not take place. And in the fall of that same year, the world economy began its plunge into the Great Depression. Governments were shaken and toppled, and those that did not choose the Russian era of international communism embraced its irritable cousin, fascism, or national socialism. By the death of Pius XI, the 20-year pause in fighting was at an end, and the world was heading once more into global conflict, precisely as Our Lady had foretold to the shepherd children in 1917. For she said, after showing them that awful vision of hell, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go, To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on First Saturdays. If my requests are heard, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Several nations will be annihilated. No one can doubt that all of those prophecies have been fulfilled 
to the letter. But those who are very knowledgeable, who have read up very much on the prophecies of Fatima, might ask at this point, yes, all those things did come to pass, but surely that time is at an end. After all, didn't the Pope fulfill Our Lady's request in 1984? I cannot preach to you definitively on that question. One can say that it is a matter open to discussion. Several holy prelates whom we know and trust maintain that it did not take place because the Pope did not fulfill the requirement of mentioning Russia by name. And at any rate, if we believe in Our Lady of Fatima, any discussion of this question has clear limits. Reason, it would seem to me, allows us to hold only one of three opinions. First of all, the consecration did take place in 1984, despite its imperfections. But the conversion of Russia and the fulfillment of Our Lady's promises is being carried out slowly over several generations. Secondly, the consecration did not take place. And since the name of Russia was omitted out of fear of the world, God is punishing the world by allowing no more than the collapse of the Soviet Union, while godless ideologies continue to reign throughout the globe. Thirdly, the consecration did not play, take place as requested, but our Heavenly Mother, in her goodness, obtained from God some favors, while her children await a pope who will have the courage to do what was asked. In this discussion, it seems to me that number one, although possible, is inadmissible. It is simply not possible to imagine that a consecration done nearly 40 years ago has still not brought about what Our Lady promised. As for the opinions number two and three, I am inclined more to embrace number three. That is, this consecration did not take place as requested. Nevertheless, we have a good Heavenly Mother who has obtained from us some favors in the meantime. After all, the 1984 consecration was indeed followed by Glasnost in 1985, the program of political reform in the Soviet Union, which led ultimately to its demise in 1991. But its collapse was followed immediately by the start of endless Western wars in the Middle East, which continue today. And communist China rose to fill the void left by the Soviet bloc, spreading all the same errors. No one could pretend that any form of peace has come. But at least our Heavenly Mother took pity on Russia and allowed the collapse of the communist government so that the beginnings of her conversion are already underway. This, then, is the world in which we currently live. And Our Lady promised that these frightening times will be followed by the triumph of her Immaculate Heart. What will this triumph mean? Examining these words with the eyes of faith, we must conclude that this triumph of the heart of our Blessed Mother does not refer to the end of the world. Mary has always been, from the first moment of her existence, in the words of John the Baptist, the way prepared for the Lord. The prophet of the Old Testament and then the great Baptist cried out, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths of our God. Mary was that path for God's entry into the world, made straight from the first by her immaculate conception. Mary has always been the way of the Lord, not the end. The Sacred Heart of Jesus first came into the world nestled in the womb of his virgin mother, as the mother's heart taught the sons how to beat. That Sacred Heart comes to us here and now through the Immaculate Heart, for it is always through her intercession that he comes to us by his grace. And so the coming of the Sacred Heart as our King and Judge at the end of time 
the final triumph of that divine heart can well be understood, as it is by the saints, as something that will come after the triumph of his mother's immaculate heart here on earth. This understanding is consistent with the very words of Our Lady of Fatima. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. It is clear, then, that we cannot understand this period of peace to mean the end of the world. It will be a certain span of time before the end. How long, we cannot know for sure. But it must be long enough that the Immaculate Heart can truly triumph throughout the world for all of us to see it as the way by which the reign of the Sacred Heart will come. After all, that is the fundamental goal of the apparitions at Fatima. For Our Lady declared that her son wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. What is meant then by the word peace? Christ comes, as he told us, to give that peace which the world cannot give. It will not mean the simple absence of war, nor can it mean the complete absence of sin, for that will occur only at the end of time. But it will be a Christian world, one to rival, nay, far surpass the Christian civilization attempted in the Middle Ages. All the great nations of the world will return to the faith or convert for the first time. We will still distinguish between church and state. We will have the spiritual and the secular, but both will rightly be seen for what they truly are, parts of the mystical body of Christ, whether it be clerics governing the spiritual or Christian laymen governing the secular. Thus, it will probably not be clear whether this great conversion started in the Church or in the various states. It will start in both. Holy Churchmen will reform the clergy and preach the gospel throughout the world. And good Christian princes will enact wise laws to promote the reign of Christ through the Immaculate Heart throughout society. We will likely see the restoration of monarchy and the reconverted Christian nations perhaps even the return of one great monarchy in something like the Holy Roman Empire. No longer will we speak of communism versus capitalism, for this will now be seen to be a failed dichotomy hoisted upon us by the now refuted atheistic materialism. Everyone will see that mammon and usury can never again be the driving force of human endeavors. Men will still sin by greed and steal from others through envy, but these sins will no longer masquerade as economic progress or redistribution to correct social inequity. Men will still buy and sell and use money, and the right to property, a natural right, will everywhere be respected. But these things will be acknowledged as a means to a higher spiritual end, we will still have rich and poor, great men and small, and everyone will know that he is to be content with the role he has in this passing world. Heresy, effeminacy, and impurity will be utterly driven out of the church hierarchy. Russia and all the peoples of the East will return to their orthodox faith and add to it finally their submission so long forgotten to the Roman Pontiff. The whole world will come to know holy, zealous priests and bishops. Sinful churchmen will, of course, remain, but they will be the exception, and the rest of the hierarchy will denounce their scandalous behavior and call them to repentance. The sacred liturgy will reign supreme in society, be it the venerable and ancient ceremonies of converted Russia and the East or the glorious Roman rite of the West. The solemn celebration of Holy Mass 
will be the event around which all of this society will revolve. No longer will Christians content themselves with the short list of holy days of obligation drawn up in the modern era. All the dozens of ancient festivals will find their place again on the calendar and be faithfully observed by shop owners and government officials. Of course, sin will remain in the souls of fallen men, along with the need to purge it. And so the great seasons of penance will be restored as well. Advent, Lent, Ember Days, Rogation Tide, and Vigils. The Pope will be seen by all to be the vicar of Christ on earth, model of obedience unto death. Before he is crowned as sovereign pontiff, he will lay his right hand upon the sacred oracles and take the ancient coronation oath, swearing to preserve and violate all the articles of faith and sacred ceremonies of our fathers. What will be the lifeblood of this society? No need for speculation here. This reborn Christendom will be founded on love for the Holy Mother of God and devotion to her Immaculate Heart. Fulton Sheen was fond of saying, to a great extent, the level of any civilization is the level of its womanhood. When a man loves a woman, he has to become worthy of her. And the higher her virtue, the more a man has to aspire to become worthy of her. Well, what can we say of a civilization whose men are inspired to live lives worthy of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the woman crowned with all virtues? Yes, this will be the foundation of a true restoration of culture. The revolution of impurity will be long forgotten. Men will once more be men, and women will be women. What of the other religions? Will they all cease to exist? Probably not, for sin will still be in the world, including sins against the First Commandment. But they will be much reduced, such as they will not be the cause of any serious conflict with Christian nations. We can well hope at least that the cruel crescent of Mohammed will be entirely eclipsed. As for the Jews, it is not at all clear that this will be the time of their mass conversion foretold by St. Paul. Though many Jews of good will doubtless will find their way to Christ during this period of peace, the rest will continue in their obstinacy until the coming of Antichrist, when at last they will see how blind they were to suppose that the Messiah had not yet come. This period of peace will not be a paradise on earth, but it will be a necessary preparation for the end of time and God's merciful designs. It is our Blessed Mother who has obtained for us this grace, that before the end the world should become truly Christian, so that the truth of the gospel and the divine foundation of the Church should be plain for all to see. Only bad will will then cause people to prefer the darkness to the light which shines so beautifully before them. This triumph, this reign of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is coming soon. We can hope that those of us who are not martyred will live to see it. In the meantime, let us keep up on making our first Saturdays. The request of Our Lady is that every one of us should make five. Though, of course, if we love our mother, we will continue making them as often as possible until our death. Why five first Saturdays? St. Lucy's confessor asked her this question, and the response she received from our Lord was that these five first Saturdays should be made in reparation for five specific outrages. Denial of the Immaculate Conception, denial of the Divine Maternity, denial of Our Lady's perpetual virginity, the belittling of Our Blessed Mother to children, and the irreverence for her images. It is clear to see that the reparation made now for these outrages will be the foundation 
of this society to come, which will be founded on honoring and loving the Immaculate Heart of Mary in all facets of life. Whatever end God has decreed for each of us, whether we should live to see that day or not, we can take courage from the words Our Lady has spoken to us in our time. Do you suffer much? Do not be discouraged. I will never forsake you. My Immaculate Heart will be your consolation and the way that will lead you to God. Amen.